So our first talk of the second session, as we discussed, whether it's afternoon or evening or just late morning, depends on your time zone is uh, Eugene Gorski from the University of California, Davis, who will tell us about parabolic Hilbert schemes uh, via the Dunkel Optum subalgebra. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so thanks for the organizers for this very nice conference. I feel like I follow more talks than usual. Maybe there is like less distraction because there are no actual people. I don't know, but it's so weird. <laughs> uh, anyway, so this is a joint work with Jose Simental and Monica Zirania, also at UC Davis. And I'll speak about Hebrew scheme of points on single curves and the uh, rational Chernik algebras via this Dunkel of them subalgebra. So first of all, what is a rational Chernik algebra? So it has uh, generators x1 through xn, yy through yn, uh, and a group algebra of symmetric group. And the relations are that x is commute between themselves, y commute between themselves, they interact with the SN as they would be expected, but the interesting relations are commutation relations between X's and Y's. And so Y's and X's with different indices commute to the transposition up to a factor, uh, and Y's with X's with the same index commute with identity plus sum of transpositions again up to a factor. And so there are two parameters here, T and C. Uh, in many places in the literature, people just use one parameter C and set T is equal to one but sometimes it's useful to set t is equal to zero, and this will be a slightly different algebra, and we'll discuss it in the end of the talk. So, but of course, if you rescale both t and c simultaneously, you get the same algebra because you can see it from the relations. So this is the algebra, and again, for experts, it's easier for this setup to work with the uh, Chernik algebra associated to a permutation representation of SN and not the reflection representation. Although, in principle, you can redo all this for reflection representation. Okay. So, uh, this algebra has very nice uh, representation category. It has some kind of category O, and it's a highest weight category with standard modules defined as follows. So, you start from a reducible representation of SN, and then you induce up uh, to uh, Chernik algebra, which practically means that you take this reducible representation and you multiply by polynomials in axis. So you think of it as a copy, as a representation of polynomials in y's smash Sn, where Sn acts as usual and y's act by zero on V lambda. And then from this, you induce up to the whole Chernik algebra. So size-wise, it's just V lambda times polynomial in axis. And uh, it's known that uh, delta lambda has unique simple quotient, which is denoted by LC of lambda. And all this depends on parameter C. And then a theorem from about 10 or 15 years ago by Ginsburg, Way, Obdam Rukia, Barry Setting of Ginsburg, describes a lot of facts about represent this representation category. And uh, I'll say more a bit about it later, but let me mention some facts which are useful. So if C is irrational or has denominator greater than N, so it was all about SN, then actually standard module is irreducible for all lambda. But if your denominator, for example, is equal to n, you have interesting representation theory, uh, and the standard module is irreducible unless lambda is a hook, it, is, it has a non-trivial sub-module if it is a hook, but the only interesting morphisms between standard modules for hook form this BGG resolution. So there is a map from standard module for a hook to standard module for a next hook, uh, and they form this kind of chain. Composition is zero just because there are no morphisms from hooks of distance two. Uh, and the simple module is just the quotient of the standard module by the image of the next one. And this is it. And maybe let me mention that all these facts, especially in this work of Ginsburg, Gray, of Demer and Rukia, they were proved using Knizhny Eximological Funter. So Knizhny Eximological Funter relates representation theory of HC in this category O and representation theory of Hecke algebra as root of unity. So you take Hecke algebra with parameter Q, which is exponential of two pi C. And then if C is rational, this means that Q is the root of unity. Uh, and then there is this functor and it's defined analytically using complex analysis, essentially because you look at monodromes of some connections. 
And so one of the goals of this talk is to give a new presentation or rather slightly different presentation of this algebra to construct explicit bases in standard and simple modules and to give new combinatorial proof of the previous theorem by Ginsburg, Ogden, Murkia and other people. Uh, and relate all this representation theory to algebraic geometry of parabolic Hilbert schemes of points on singular curves. And I have to say right away that this new presentation was considered in slightly different form by Suzuki, uh, Griffiths, and Webster, and other people. So it's not so new, we just apply it slightly differently. Okay. And so for this, uh, let me mention uh, a fine symmetric group. In the extended defined symmetric group, so it's defined as a set of n periodic permutations of the integer, so bijections from z to z, such that p of i plus n is uh, p of i plus n. And it's determined by this window notation where I just fix the images of p of 1 through p of n. And then the most important thing, which will be important for us, is that it has standard generators of Sn and an extra element pi which shifts i by one. And so normally people, of course, consider this uh, extended defined symmetric group as a group with this s i and pi. Sometimes you add a generator zero by combining them uh, and pi is invertible, but you can consider a positive monoid generated just by s's and pi, but you not allow pi inverse. So s's are inverses of themselves, but you don't allow pi to be invertible. Uh, and then it's easy to check that this positive monoid consists of all permutations such that in window notation, all entries are positive or equivalently P of I is positive for all positive I. Okay, so this is a sub uh, set of extended affine symmetric group, which is closed under multiplication, but not closed under taking inverses. All right, so here's the new presentation of the algebra. Uh, so we start with this operators constructed first by Dunkel and Obdam. So there are x i y i minus a combination of transpositions. So this is the juices Murphy element in Sn, and then you add x i y with a coefficient. So this will be our generators, and the key fact about them, which was observed by Dunkel and Obdam, that they commute. So this is a huge commutative subalgebra in rational Chernik algebra. And there are two more generators, which are essentially x1 and y1, but it's easier to work with x1 twisted by a full cycle and y1 twisted by a full cycle. So we call them tau and lambda. And so we're, the algebra is generated by all these UIs, SI are generators of symmetric group, tau and lambda. And the relations are as follows. So UIs commute between themselves. UIs and SIs, almost commute and they form the January defined Hecke algebra with parameter C. So SI and UI with distance indices commute and close indices relate like this. Then tau kind of shifts UI by one and then you, if you apply it to the last UN, then it goes back to U1 shifted by T. So tau in some sense act as this operator pi in the fine symmetric group. Lambda also acts as some kind of analog of pi in the fine symmetric group, so it shifts UIs backwards. And then there are all these relations between SI and tau, so SI, tau also shifts SI, and tau square sends S1 to SN minus one. And these are precisely the relations satisfied by pi uh, and SI in the extended to fine symmetric group. So, this weird relation with this tau squared, it actually has a clear meaning because somehow if tau would be invertible, this means that you conjugate S1 twice by tau squared, then you get Sn minus one. Uh, and that is just means that if you conjugate it once by tau, you get to a zero, and then you get again to Sn minus one. But tau is not invertible, and so you have to be careful with that. And so you just write relation like this and you can check that this is actually enough relations to describe this positive monoid. And exactly the same story in opposite direction with lambda. So again, lambda is not invertible, uh, but somehow if you conjugate by lambda square S1, you get Sn minus one. And there are three more relations which kind of 
relate tau and lambda. So before they were unrelated. So the product one way is u1. That's easy to see. Uh, that this is just x1, y1. The product the other way will be un plus t. And then there is this weird relation, which is also useful. And so the content is the theorem that these relations are sufficient to describe rational training algebra. Uh, and of course, the comment is that in principle, you can eliminate all use. You can just work with tau, lambda, and sn. But in practice, it's really useful to keep use and keep all these relations and work with this. OK? Any questions? Uh, so yeah, UI in symmetric group case appeared before the uncle of them. Okay, maybe I'm not sure. Uh, okay, and so with this, so yeah, well, I've already mentioned that this presentation appeared in the work of Griffith and especially Suzuki and Webster. Uh, and in this presentation, we have several interesting subalgebras. In particular, UI and SI generate degenerate affine Hecke. SI and tau generate a copy of a positive affine monoid. And so tau corresponds to pi, but it's not invertible. And you can identify this positive affine monoid with just this product of polynomials in axis and SN. But Virginia, I, I can ask a question. Yeah, sure. This UI, so what do they correspond to in the Daha? Do they have any meaning? What does they correspond to in the Daha? So they, they're generators of trigonometric uh, Chernik algebra. So, I mean, Suzuki would phrase it as embedding of rational Chernik algebra into trigonometric ones. And so these are generators of trigonometric. Uh, but I'm not sure about Daha. And then Katarina also has a question. Uh, yes. okay. So is there a good explanation why what this XI, YI term means? I mean, the rest I understand, of course, but... Um, uh, you want something degree zero, I would say. So X, I have degree plus one, Y, I have degree minus one, and you want something of degree zero if you want to diagonalize them. Yeah, okay. Uh, but uh, also they correspond to trigonometric uh, uh, Chernik algebra, I guess, in the uncle presentation. And there is, yeah. But I think, like, I mean, for practical purposes, what people did like what Suzuki and Griffith and other people did. So you want to diagonalize these UIs. Uh, and so if you want to diagonalize something, it's better be degree zero. Okay. Yes. And so SI and tau generate a copy of positive affine monoid. Again, tau is not invertible. And the sine lambda generate a copy of the same monoid, but now lambda is pi inverse. So this is kind of inverse of this positive monoid. And so now with this, so we can reprove like all representation theory of rational Schrodinger algebra on most of it without uh, uh, applying to. Did you just freeze for everyone else? Oh, no, maybe not. Say it again. Can you hear me? Hello. I think this was a mistake. Yeah, I can see you. So it works, right? Yeah, go ahead, Eugene. OK. Yeah. So in particular, you can avoid using KZ Founder in many places. So the key theorem that we prove is that the standard module has a basis of the following form. So the basis is labeled by pairs uh, of standard tableau of shape lambda uh, and A, which is a vector with non-negative entries of n integers. And then the basis is not so hard to construct, but the key fact is that the action of UI is triangular with respect to certain order in this basis. And we can compute generalized eigenvalues, uh, and they're given by as follows. So this is AI minus the content of the box in T. So let me unpack this. So first of all, if I have the vector A, I can find the permutation which sorts A and I pick the minimal lens permutation which sorts A. This is the GA of I. Then I look at this uh, box inside standard Yan tableau labeled by the J of I. Take the content, multiply by C, and add AI. So this uh, minimal lens permutation that sorts A is kind of tricky, but in practice, it's very easy to compute all these things. And again, the key fact, uh, which is 
kind of easy to see from this presentation, but this is really the key for everything that uh, the action is triangular. So we know generalized eigenvalues right away. And so the basis can be obtained uh, by just applying this positive uh, braid monoid to eigenbasis in B lambda. And then the order uh, is related to lexicographic order on this positive braid monoid in window notation. So there is some combinatorics there, but that's what it is. And in fact, we can do slightly more. So we have a result like how to decompose this as a representation of degenerate affine Hecke. So it's filtered by some modules which we can identify. Okay. And so what are the consequences of this? So in particular, once we know the generalized eigenvalues for UIs, for all C, we can uh, say that, for example, if C is irrational, then this module is irreducible just because all these eigenvalues are different uh, for different modules and for different factors. And so they never match, and so there are no morphisms. Uh, the same way is slightly more complicated. If C is rational with denominator B, there is a morphism from standard module to standard module if they have the same B core. Uh, and if the denominator is bigger than N, it's irreducible. And so for, for this, you don't need the uh, uh, UIs to be semi-simple. You don't need to be diagonalizable in principle. This just works. Uh, if it is semi-simple though, uh, you can say more. And that was done by Griffith before we slightly rewrite his uh, results. So then the joint spectrum of UI is simple. All UIs are diagonalizable. And we can actually find an eigenbasis for UIs such that they act with this eigenvalues WI. Uh, tau sends eigenvector to eigenvector, shifted by pi. And lambda sends eigenvector to eigenvector times the eigenvalue for U1. And then the action of SN is a bit more complicated. It's this basically Jan semi-normal construction. So there is some formula with rational functions, but you can compute it in this case as well. And also in this case, we can compute all non-zero maps within all standard modules. So since we're in denominator n case, all non-zero maps are just maps in the BJG resolution. But again, in this basis, we can compute it very explicitly. So with, uh, because everything is semi-simple, you know that the map should send eigenvector to another eigenvector or zero. And uh, there is an interesting bijection between like uh, standard, the pair of vector and standard tableau on one side and the vector and standard tableau on the other side. And so let me maybe uh, give you an example how this works. So again, in this case, the interesting modules, they come from hook representations of SN. They correspond to uh, exterior powers of reflection representation or partition and minus L and one L. And then in this partition, uh, again, the back, in the standard module, the basis is parameterized by a pair integer vector and tableau. And in this tableau, we can look at the label of the box at the bottom of this hook. So this is a box with the smallest content in this uh, hook, in this tableau. And then we can just describe the basis in simple modules just by looking at discriminatorics. So simple module corresponding to hook has a basis indexed by pairs A and T. So T is again standard tableau of the same hook shape. And A satisfies some inequalities. And inequalities are like this. So you take A with this index G A inverse of N minus M is less than A J inverse of I L. Recall that GA is the permutation which sorts this vector A of minimal lens. Uh, and then there is a second inequality to so if it is uh, equal to, if the difference is equal to M, then you have this inequality between Gs. So you, I understand it's hard to parse. So in uh, this trivial module case, so if you just induce representation from trivial module and take the simple quotient, then the basis is actually quite cute. So it just, so there are no standard, there is just one standard tableau in this case. You just have this Yan diagram. Uh, and then the inequalities are that for every pair of A's, the difference is less than M. Uh, and then if the difference less than or equal to M, and then if it is exactly equal to M, 
then the one with uh, the smaller number is always to the right of the bigger number. So this is some very explicit combinatorial condition that we have here. And this uh, theorem above is some kind of generalization of that to the case of uh, hooks and to the case of more general partitions. And so again, in principle, all this is done just by looking at spectrum and trying to look like that this maps should send eigenvector for use to eigenvector for use and how this could match, how the eigenvalues could match for all use. Uh, and I think that's a place for a break. And there were some questions which I missed, I'm sorry. No, I think I think uh, most of the questions are either pretty far away or yeah, okay. I mean, we have a break, so let me. I mean, everybody through. can unmute himself or herself. Everyone should be able to unmute. Yeah, so maybe, yeah, but first of all, I should mention, so for cyclotomics, the Ration 3 nuclear algebra is a generalization of this. Uh, it was done by Stephen Griffith. Uh, why do we need monoid instead of the group? Because uh, tau is not invertible and pi is not invertible in this bit. So tau is not invertible and lambda is not invertible. So you have these two extra generators. They kind of behave like pi in the fine symmetric group, but they're not invertible. Uh, and okay. I think it's not true that the monoid is generated by the generators that you said. Why? I mean, take permutation which begins with zero. I mean, with one or like with the minimal element, how do you reduce it to a smaller mutation? I mean, you either sort it or use pi. But it begins with zero, so you cannot use pi. We can talk later. I'm not sure I understand the question. <laughs> Maybe it's stupid, but I'm just confused. Who drew your intermission slide? Yeah, my daughter. That's what I thought. That's good. Okay. Should we continue? Ah, uh, sure. So now I want to switch completely from algebra to geometry and talk like how this perspective, which was you know, already there, work with many people, how you can use it to actually understand geometry better. And that's what dear to my heart. So uh, you start from singular curve, x to the m is equal to y to the n on the plane. And the greatest common divisor of m and n is one. So this is actually a reducible curve with some kind of cusp at the origin. Uh, and then you can look at the Hebrew scheme of this curve. So how does it look like? So first of all, you have a local ring of functions there. So this is just functions in x and y quotient by relation that x to the m is equal to y to the n. Uh, and then in this ring, you can think of it in various ways, but one way is to find the basis. So you just find the basis where you have one y up to y to the n minus one. And then y to the n is equal to x to the m. So you have all power series in x, but you allow just powers of y, which are from one to y to y to the n minus one. And then it's free over x, and then multiplication by y, x is an operator which sends one to y, y to y square, and so on. And y to the n minus one to x to the m. So you can think of it as just of this uh, lattice over c of x with an interesting action of multiplication by y. And then we define the Hebrew scheme as the space of ideals in O of co-dimension K. Uh, and again, if we want to think of it more algebraically, you can think of it as a subspace in C of X with this basis. Uh, 
which is invariant under multiplication of x, so this is a sub lattice, and also invariant under multiplication of y, which is uh, important. And also we can consider parabolic Hubert scheme, which is the space of flags of ideals, uh, where jk is inside jk plus one, contain jk plus one and so on, and can, the last one, jk plus n minus one, contain uh, jk plus n, which is x jk. So all of these are ideals, and again, the last one is x times the first one. And maybe let me add a comment here that a similar construction appeared, and so this construction is motivated by my previous work with Anton and Eric Carlson when we considered this parabolic Hubert scheme on the plane. But here we look at it uh, for a single curve, it's kind of the same idea. Uh, and here we have a choice, so somehow the choice so Hebert scheme is just defined as a space of ideals. Here we choose a projection of the curve because we multiply by x, we can choose to multiply by y. And then this would be different and in particular co-dimension of j mod jk plus n, it is equal to n, while co-dimension of j mod y, j would equal to m. So in principle, we have two different constructions and there is a choice here. All right. Uh, and then, uh, Combinatorially, we can think of the fixed point of the action. So this curve in particular is quasi homogeneous. There is an action of C star, and it gives an action of C star on the Hubert scheme uh, and on parabolic Hubert scheme. And fixed points for the Hubert scheme will be monomial ideals. So there will be staircases uh, in the strip. So we have a strip of height n, uh, and the all squares in the strip, they form a basis in O, in the ring of functions on the curve. And if I have an ideal, this, this is some kind of staircase, and the condition is that uh, the width of the staircase is at most M. And the reason is quite clear, because for example, I have this cell labeled by one, so it corresponds to X cubed Y square. If I multiply it by an extra Y, uh, I get X cubed Y cube, but I know that y cube is equal to x to the fourth. So it, if it contains this box labeled by one, it must contain this box labeled by two, so that it's invariant under y. Uh, and so in particular, the fixed points uh, correspond to staircases, on the Hubert scheme, they correspond to staircases of widths at most m, and on the flag Hubert scheme, they correspond to staircase with a labeling of entries right to the right of the staircase, so that we know which entries to remove. And so to this diagram, I can associate a flag of monomial ideals. In particular here, if I include one, two, and three, I get ideal generated by x cubed y square, which is number one. It automatically contains this number two, and x five y is this number three. Then the next ideal would be the same thing when I remove one, uh, and it will be x four y square, x five y, and x seven, and so on. So the flag of monomial ideals, uh, and then you can study them and the combinatorics. Uh, and so here is the theorem. So there is an action of rational tree Nick algebra with parameters m and n in localized equivalent homology of the union of all these parabolic Hubert schemes, and the corresponding representation is isomorphic to uh, this uh, reducible representation L M N. So in particular, there is a bijection, so there are the staircases, and there is a bijection between the staircases and the eigenvectors, which we described before, when we have just tuples of integers, in this case, just tuples of integers satisfying some inequalities. And these are the same inequalities that you see here, in some sense. And so how does this representation work? So again, I would say it's surprisingly easy, and it's much easier than many other constructions that appeared here. And again, it's not super uh, new, but slightly different. So uh, you have the following things. So first of all, this operators UI, they correspond to line bundles. So you have this flag of ideals, you can take quotients, and uh, the quotient of these ideals gives a line bundle on this thing. By some weird reason, you need to relabel them. So you need to swap the order of these line bundles to get used correctly. That's fine. So u n plus one minus i correspond to line bundle L i. Then action of S n 
is given by some kind of Springer-like action when you forget one flag in the middle and you push forward and pull back and you can do it very carefully. And then the interesting thing is this tau. So tau was kind of twisted multiplication by x1, but here it's just a sliding of the flag. So you have a flag of ideals uh, and it starts from jk, it ends at jk plus n, which is a mul x times jk. And you just forget about jk, you start from jk plus one, and you add jk plus n plus one in the end, which is x jk plus one. So this is just a map of spaces. It's not some weird correspondence. And of course it induces the map on homology and this is just tau. And it sends fixed points to fixed points, it sends staircases to staircases, so everything is easy. And then a more subtle thing, which is new in this rational situation, uh, is that the image of tau, so how would you describe the image of tau, of t? It's the set of flags where next to last flag is divisible by x. And so if it's divisible by x, then you can divide by x and get back to this construction on the left. And so uh, when it's divisible by x, you can check that this condition defines a zero locus of a section of some explicit line bundle. And then you can use a Giesen map to define an operator from homology on, of space on the right to homology of space on the left. And this is also somehow this is much easier than many constructions, various actions and Hebrew schemes that uh, we all know and love. So there are no Nakajima correspondences, there are no kind of complicated things. And the reason why there are no, because somehow this P help is already a Nakajima correspondence itself somehow. It already has a lot of flags in it. But that's just true. And then you need, uh, so there are potentially two different ways to check relations. So one way is dramatically check all the relations between these operators in geometry, and that would be nice, but we were lazy. And instead we just localize the fixed points and check that in fixed points, all these operators agree with the operators that we defined before uh, in the basis for the trivial, for this simple representation. And so if they agree, they must satisfy the same relations. And so again, for this, you need localization. So. I think an interesting open question is, does it work in non-localized equivalent homology? So do this equation satisfy geometrically or not? But yeah, that we don't know. And again, maybe it's a good place to refer to the paper with Anton and Eric, where we had this parabolic Hebrew scheme for the plane. So all Hebrew scheme, all, all points on the plane C2, and you can define the same kind of construction and very similar operators. And the corresponding algebra that we get is this algebra AQT that Anton and Eric constructed in combinatorial setup, but there is a geometric interpretation using these things. But this lambda appears to be in U and not appear there. Okay. And another interesting feature is that you can take the limit as m goes to infinity. And then you add a curve y to the n is equal to x to the m. If we take the limit, this is non-reduced curve y to the n is equal to zero. And personally, I haven't seen like any constructions geometric with non Hebrew schemes of non-reduced curves, so they're, they're important for many reasons. But you can just take the limit of what, all what happened here. So in particular, the fixed points are like the staircases of bounded width. You ignore this bound on the width and then you have all staircases in the strip. And then the same way, so you had polynomial representation of rational Turing algebra with this nice basis and you just take the limit and it just works. So all the formulas for the action of all these operators, they just extend to this case nicely. And the result is this, uh, not the simple representation, but the polynomial representation of uh, rational Chernigh algebra at t is equal to zero. Uh, and maybe one remark here is that, so at t is equal to zero, it's well known that the algebra has a huge center uh, given by symmetric polynomials in axis. And you can ask what it does it mean geometrically and we don't know that. So I don't know, but it would be nice to understand like where the center comes from for this non-reduced curves. But I think like, Anything about the uh, Hebrew schemes of non-reduced curves is very much wide open, but very interesting and also related to not homology and other things. Okay, so, uh-huh. Yes, let me go to the So the question chapter. is whether there is the, uh, uh, the unique graded quotient of this delta zero one? No, 
this has a geometric interpretation. I don't know. That would be nice. Uh, uh, because uh, somehow this is just the whole Hubert scheme. The question, I mean, what is unique simple quotient? So the symmetric functions in X's, they are in the center of, uh, of the algebra at t is equal to zero. And you can just quotient by all the symmetric function in X's. And so I think this is equivalent to finding the geometric interpretation of those. And that would be nice, but uh, I don't know. Uh, and also Ben says that it should hold in non-localized uh, homology because this is related to Coulomb branch and that uh, I'll mention in a second, yes. Uh, and yeah, maybe another thing, so we localize here. So in principle, you can ask what's going on. So you can check, it's not completely obvious, but the space is paved by fine cells. So all homology is even, the space is equivalently formal. So at least, uh, like homology is free or recurring homology of a point, but the action you still need to check things. Right. And so this, and now, so I want to mention the relation to previous work and to some very recent work, which I find very exciting. So previous work was a lot of work related to trigonometric Cherenic algebra. So if you, instead of considering Hebrew scheme of points, uh, you consider fine spring of fibers. Uh, then a lot of work started from Varaniel Zero, Lustig, Oblomkov, Oblomkov, Yun, and especially Yun. Uh, they defined an action of trigonometric Cherenic algebra on homology of certain fine spring of fiber in a fine flag variety, which also is kind of related to this. Uh, but the relation to rational Cherenic algebra was also, so it appeared in a block of Yun in particular, but it was very much roundabout. So you have to embed uh, rational to trigonometric, which is more or less what we do here, but also on geometric side, you need to do a lot of work. So you need to consider perverse filtration on homology. You need to embed the spectral curves in a family of spectral curves. And so somehow you need to use this trigonometric and you need to use a lot of geometry there and somehow I feel that like the construction that we have here is much easier than that because you kind of, you, you just don't think about the action of trigonometric Cherenic algebra and you don't think about a fine spring fibers and you just do it directly. But maybe again, it's not so important. What is more important I think is this recent result of Gardner and Kivinen when they say that instead of classical affine spring fibers, you should look at uh, generalized affine spring fibers. So here's the statement. So you start from any plane curve singularity, like absolutely any. You don't have any restrictions. It shouldn't be of this type x to the m is equal to y to the n. You can start from any plane curve singularity. You choose a projection to a line. So that was our map x. And you want the projection to have degree n. And then the claim is that this all Hebert schemes of points is just to generalize the fine Springer fiber in the sense of Brown, Ron, Finkelberg, and Nakajima. And in their big BFN theory, you need to choose a group, and the group is GLN, and you need to choose a representation, and the representation is a joint uh, plus the vector representation. And then to define a fine spring of fiber, you need to choose a vector in this representation. And this is basically the choice of a vector uh, is, so you identify CN with CN of O with uh, this ring of functions on the curve, and the vector is like one in the ring of functions on the curve, and the matrix that you get in JLN will be the action of Y on this ring of functions on the curve, basically. So this is very clear and transparent, and also this parabolic Huber scheme, which we use, you can also interpret in this term, so you just need to insert this uh, Iwahori subgroup somewhere and say how it's related to Iwahori. So this is again some version of generalized the fine spring fiber, when you have not only group and representation, but also you choose a parahoric subgroup and you can do this. Uh, and so why this is important? Because uh, first of all, given G and V as above, so Browerman, Finkelberg and Nakajima defined a certain algebra, which is called Coulomb branch algebra, and it's non-commutative version. And then in very 
big generality, there was a recent paper by Hilburn, Kamser, and Wicks, and they proved that uh, this Coulomb branch algebra associated to GNV acts in homology of all generalized Sprenger fibers corresponding to GNV. So if a Sprenger fiber is kind of random, then you have this commutative algebra which acts in homology. And if Sprenger fiber is additionally equivalent under loop rotation, then you can quantize everything and non-commutative deformation of this Coulomb branch algebra acts on equivariant homology with respect to loop rotation of the generalized Springer fiber. And so, in some sense, all that happened before is a special case of this construction, because you start from uh, the group GLN, you start from representation, which is a joint plus the vector. Kodera and Nakajima identified explicitly quantum Coulomb branch algebra with a spherical rational Chernik algebra, and so, in particular, what Garner and Kivinen did, so they took their preservation from last slide and they computed, computed the section of uh, Coulomb branch algebra on homology of the Hebert scheme of points on this curve explicitly. And so, again, this, if you look at the Hebert scheme as opposed to parabolic Hebert scheme, this would be the spherical rational Chernik algebra. So, in particular, that's the new construction or the same old construction of. Uh, spherical uh, rational Chernik algebra on homology of this guy, and it would be interesting to upgrade it to parabolic version when you have uh, parabolic Hubert scheme of points and compare the action with the kind of elementary action that we constructed above. And I think also here. Thanks very much for the next So are there more questions? Um, right, so about this last thing, I, I just want to say like, we can define on this parabolic level, like you have an action, but comparing to uh, this description in terms of fixed points, uh, I don't know if that works outside the sort of spherical level, or at least I don't know how to make it work. No, I, I think it shouldn't be very hard. I mean, the, the formulas Eugene wrote for the action, I mean, those are, they're the exact same formulas that are in my paper matching but, the... Sure, but but I mean, general, like, changes of bases and things like this um, aren't easy. Like, maybe you can restrict this action. It's just trivial that um, it acts in the right way, but... I don't know. I mean, I think, right? I mean, it, it's just like... Right, there's a line operator whose endomorphisms are the, uh, the trivial line operator whose endomorphisms are the, the spherical guy. And then there's this a bigger line operator uh, using the flag variety whose endomorphisms are the full rational Chernik algebra. And I think if you just take the same line operators you're using, but pair them with this bigger guy instead of the trivial, you're just gonna get their story. Oh, absolutely, but yeah, I mean, th there's still like some computation to do to verify that it's the same action on fixed points, but yeah, anyway. Yeah, but also like I would be interested to see, I mean, maybe I'm just stupid, so like how explicitly, like you have this giant algebra which is built out of this homology of this big BFN space, like how explicitly compare it to some operators that we see? I mean, if we can do it by localization, fine, but like maybe geometrically, like why does the same action is like shifting the flag and you know, but I mean, those are the formulas in my paper. Like, okay. okay. Um, yeah. No, I mean the right. Like, you just interpret these things you're talking about as homology classes, and those, like, right. This is the. I mean, it, it, right. It's much easier to do this because you have the the flag variety in the picture. You're you know you're using the Iwahori instead of the trivial line operator. So, I mean, I, I, I actually think it's it's one of these things where you just have to take three or four papers and understand all their notation, and then it'll be very easy. Yeah, I guess that's my problem for a like but, but does it mean you, you work with a different presentation? Or, or how, why, why does it become easier then? Um, well, I, I guess what I'm saying is, like, I mean, you know, I wrote in my paper an isomorphism between, you know, some 
you know, um, one of these BFN type spaces, the homology of that with the rational Schrodinger algebra in this SN case. And it's like exactly the same formulas that Eugene was writing for the action on the Hilbert scheme. So like, I mean, it, uh, again, you know, yeah, like you have to actually write things down, but I, I think it's just, you write that projective Hilbert scheme as a, a fiber product. And then you use the fact that when you like, when you have a fiber product, you get an action of the convolution algebra on that. Like, I mean, I guess secretly Eugene is also using this isomorph, like using um, like Atiyah bot to have an isomorphism between the equivalent homology of the fixed points and the actual space. So you have to follow through that somehow to compare the two actions. No, I would just say that like, like if you write, for example, this Kodera and the Kajima, isomorphism explicitly it's, it's pretty subtle i would say and so like in particular representation that you get is a difference representation so you, it takes some work to relate but i mean i agree that all formals are the same in just a matter of time yes okay so and understanding all the notations in all papers which i'm very yeah, mm, yeah. hard yeah. no i agree I have a question. I mean, I... uh eugene can i ask a question uh-huh um yeah so i I was wondering, um, how do you get to the representation that's finite dimensional when you mod out by whatever the extra stuff is, like um, in your GL inversion going to the SL inversion? Um, do you have a way to get to a basis for that representation for L of Triv? Uh, you have a basis, yes, but that that was basis also was constructed by Griffith, uh, I guess. But I think but genetically. Say again? But geometrically, can you get it that yeah, way? Yeah, geometrically, so you have an action of some operator, which is like the sum of x's. So you need to quotient by the sum of x's, roughly speaking. And that we see pretty explicitly, yes. But what kind of space it is, it's hard to say. Uh, I don't know. I mean, so we see this action of sum of x's pretty explicitly, I would say. But uh, quotienting by that, I'm not sure what this means. So there is a... Let me restate differently. So if you look at all Hebert schemes on a curve, so you have an interesting operator which kind of adds a point from a Hebert scheme to the next Hebert scheme. And then somehow in the limit, this Hebert scheme stabilized to what is called compactified Jacobian of the curve. And that is a fine, like, a fine space. Uh, so it has a fine dimensional homology and that homology is equivalent to LMN. But somehow if you want to compare homology properly, you need to uh, put a certain filtration on homology and take the associated graded. And that's precisely what was done by Blomkov and Yoon when they say that instead of looking at the Hubert scheme, they look at this compactified Jacobian with perverse filtration. And there are like lots of technical difficulties there. So in some sense, yes. And that was in this blomkov yoon paper, but yeah. Okay, thanks. So I wanted to ask you a bit more about this dependence on M. So how, can you say somehow how the formulas depend on M? Is it, can you just specialize totally naively or, or take this limit totally naively in the formula? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you have this formula, uh, let me go back and just look at the eigenvalues. So somehow you have this AI mm -hmm. uh, and this content times C. So C is M over N. So if M is very large, then this uh, second term becomes much bigger than the first term and just ignore this AI. Okay. And somehow you have to check. So that the weights specialize nicely. I mean, you have to rescale everything by M, but that's fine. You just kind of look at the second term. And then you have this action of SN by this kind of Jan seminoral formulas. Again, you have to take the limit, but it also works. So this, this is pretty naive and again, not, not so deep as. You and here that. again, so the action of tau and the action of lambda, they just work the same way. So the base is, they, has a nice limit and everything has a nice limit, yes. So I know, I'm oh, sorry. Uh, can you expand the picture to get more modules, uh, not only the LNM? Uh, say it again, I'm sorry. Uh, so 
can you get more modules uh, in, a, in a similar fashion outside uh, the LNM trip, the construction that you showed? Uh, geometrically, that would be very nice, but I don't know how to do this. So, yeah. You can try to take other uh, generalized affine spring fibers, which are not uh, Hebrew schemes. So the theorem of Gardner and Kivinen said that all uh, Hebrew schemes are generalized affine spring fibers, but not all affine spring, generalized affine spring fibers are Hebrew schemes of curves. You need some extra conditions. So maybe you take the ones which don't satisfy this condition, and maybe they give you interesting representations. I don't know. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, in the trigonometric case, there is this construction of bus flow, but it's very unclear what to do here. Uh, Eugene, I was about to ask you about, um, I was about to ask you a question that would be me guessing various parts of the connection with GNR, but rather than guess and, and embarrass myself, <laughs> you want to say something about the connection to GNR? Is there some like functor from action of Zirkle on this stuff or no? No idea. I mean, it's related to... The line doesn't do anything for you? I mean, the only relation to not homology that I know is the conjecture of a blog of Rasmussen and Shande, which says uh, that homology of these Hebrew schemes is uh, not homology for torus links. And that was actually proven by Hogenkamp and Mellet because you can compute both sides explicitly. But somehow, where is Hebrew scheme of the plane in this picture? I mean, it's also... Rational unique algebra is quantization of the Hebrew scheme of the plane, but I mean, yeah, it's all kind of far from that. I don't know. I think I see why the torus knot appears. Torus knot is the link of uh, this x to the m is equal to y to the m. Well, yeah, sure, but I mean, in the Zirkle side. I mean, I don't know. You, you don't see the Zirkle bimodules here because of sort of the the model you're using for the physics, right? Like, you know, somehow they're sneaking in the, the line operator corresponding to a loop, like the cotangent bundle to a loop in the space of um, loops into the, the matter here. But like, you aren't breaking things up in a way where you can see a, that loop is a braid closure. So there's like some serious additional like physics that needs to be done. And I mean, there are a bunch of people working on this, you know, Justin and uh, Lev Rosansky and, and Tudor. Tudor. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, maybe, I mean, one general topological comment, which is easy to say, so if you just have a curve on the plane, like what you can do, you can take intersection with a sphere, that's a link in a sphere. If you have a curve with projection on some line, you actually have a link in the solid torus for free because somehow you split your sphere into two tori uh, and then you have a link in the solid torus or a braid closure. So this gives you already more information. So this and the degree of this projection is the number of strands in the braid. Uh, but again, like cutting it into open braid, that's that's hard, I think. And yeah, maybe Lev and Tudor and Justin and other people would do it eventually. Yeah, but this is already like a central part. You don't want to cut it, right? Well, if you want to see the Zirkle bimodules, you'd better. Yeah. But I mean, you can't see the Zirkle bimodules in the normal in the normal GNR thing either. It's just a piece of it. Yeah. But also, you have like a graded ascent representation or by graded ascent representation. So they should correspond to this kind of annular invariant of this braid. And yeah. Eugen. Why did you switch from uh, K theory to cohomology? Why did I switch from K theory to cohomology? Because before you were trying, you were computing this stuff in K theory, and now you're computing in homology. Because I don't think in K theory you get rational. I mean, you get this cyclotomic Daha, Braberman, Edinglaff, and Finkelberg. It works, but nonetheless. No, you, you will get some version of Daha, I think, in K theory. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we can declare this the switch over from uh, 
question period to break. 